The Celtics Talk Podcast is presented by 24autogroup.com, 11 locations across New England. What's up, everybody? Welcome into the off day edition of the Celtics Talk Podcast, although I don't know if it was very much of an off day. Trade deadline day. It is coming on, and the Celtics end up making three moves over the final 24 hours, adding Xavier Tillman on Wednesday, and then on Thursday, right before the buzzer. Not only going out and acquiring Jaden Springer from the Philadelphia 76ers, but shipping Delano Banton to Portland. So when you kind of level set here and, and, and take a look at it after all their maneuvering, they swap out Banton and Lamar Stevens and bring back Tillman and Springer. And so while I think some of these moves could have future ramifications, um, bringing a couple depth pieces that uh, might have a better chance of getting on the floor than than what you had. And that's no disrespect to Lamar Stevens. I I've, I've, I keep saying it. Like, I, I think that's one of the more surprising things this season was that Lamar didn't get more of an opportunity to show what he can do. But undeniably, Xavier Tillman, uh, based on even just his playoff performance last year against the Lakers, has proven he can, can maybe help you manage uh, the second half of the season when you start thinking about Al Horford and Kristaps Porzingis being – brought along properly and five back-to-backs remaining on the schedule. I think they play the numbers 27 games in 52 days, maybe uh, to close out the year. So it's pretty packed in there. Uh, and while you hope the Celtics can kind of kick it to, contru- to to cruise control with a big enough lead in the East and uh, get to that number one seed, you're going to need some, some help along the way and maybe, maybe tap into something. I think when we'll, and we'll get into this with each player, but Tillman, especially, uh, you know, shades of, of Al Horford, the way he can move his feet, he can switch. I think he's got a very good chance to just sort of nice. Al's not out there. You plop him right in there. Um, can probably play with any, any other big man combo out there and just kind of eager to see what he's got. And, uh, you know, you also get his bird, right? So there's a possibility for deeper into the future. And then with Springer, uh, lives up to his last name, super springy, uh, six, four guard. Uh, I thought, I thought it was great. Someone posted that, uh, there was one comp out there coming out of, when it when it was he going through the draft process out of Tennessee and uh they compared him to Marcus Smart. And, you know, he he's his steal percentage and block percentage both in the 99th percentile per cleaning the glass this year. Not a lot of minutes played, so somewhat juiced, but when he has been out there, uh and, and one of the first things I did, I called up his defensive highlights and he's just blocking everybody and doing it in loud fashion, pinning balls off the glass. And uh it's it's pretty intriguing to see. You can see what the Sixers saw, I think it was the 28th pick in that 21 draft. So still only 21 years old, a little bit of upside. One thing, and then we get into this, you'll you'll hear some clips coming up from our trade deadline special where Scal and me and Tom Giles kind of go through the moves of the day. And uh, one of the things I came away with is, um, you know, like the Celtics have, have made it a priority to try to find low-cost talent that, you know, maybe can develop and 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 room and mold into serviceable uh, role players. You start thinking about the cost of this roster long term. There's a uh, you need players that can can do that. And the Celtics haven't had a lot of first round picks in the Brad Stevens era. Obviously, he's he's rushed to uh, to to deal those away for more established players. Maybe the biggest surprise is that you emerge from this deadline and you still have your 2024 pick, which means you know you're trending towards that 30th pick. Um, you know, that's the big question coming out of this, and you'll hear us get into it, where are you disappointed at all that the Celtics didn't make a bigger splash? I sort of said it on this podcast before, and after last night's game, you know, you, you felt the need to be maybe a little bit greedy because you just don't get to this point in the season very often where you're like, yeah, that that Celtics team is the best ba- team in basketball. And so you got to take full advantage of, of, of all those opportunities. So I thought maybe if there was a deal to be made out there, they would – they would maybe consider it, you know, start thinking about this year's first round pick again, 30th pick. I mean, eh, J.R. Giddens, no offense to J.R. Giddens, but I guess some offense to J.R. Giddens. So uh, the, the, the Celtics just have to, uh, you know, see what they got here. I think they got two players that do have the potential to impact more than the guys that were here, or at least get a more of an opportunity to show what they can do. And it adds a little intrigue to the, to the stretch run here. Cause I'm, I'm eager to see if Xavier Tillman can, can tap into what he did last year and what does it look like when you surround these 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 guys with like elite level players and you know they don't have to focus on their offense which has been the rough point for both of these but let's get it started by taking you to our trade deadline special 
here's our first uh, block of that show where me, Scal, and Tom Giles talk about the Celtics moves for the day, the Eastern Conference, and uh, just kind of how we're feeling about this team in the aftermath. Your thoughts on what the Celtics did at the uh, trade deadline, uh, in including yesterday. Okay, so starting with Tillman, I think if you look at our team and you say, whether it's the second half of the year, and I think Chris, you did a great job of explaining this the other day. Second half of the year, you know, if, if Al Horford wants to miss a game, if Porzingis misses a game, if both those guys happen to be out, I think Tillman provides that. Also, if you look last year, Tillman had a decent mm -hmm. playoff against the Lakers. Like, he was not scared of Anthony Davis. I thought he played big. I think he played with energy. He's great size. So, I'm good with the Tillman thing if, if you're looking at a, a small sample size in the regular season, and I can count on him in the playoff if a guy were to get hurt. I do believe there's still a weakness of ours with that. Mm. I, I still think I would like to have another guy, that, another big that, that can, we can handle that position, but that could be talked about in the buyout, and we'll get, it, and get into that. Jaden Springer, freak of nature. I'm not <laughs> sure if he's ready now. Sometimes when guys come to Boston, all of a sudden – like their shot gets better and, and their, their game gets better. The spacing is better. Maybe uh, Springer will be a guy that, I, like, we know that he's really good. He had a really good preseason. He could jump out the gym, head way above the rim. Like, he definitely was deserving of being a first-round draft pick. So, are they going to figure that out? It, are the Celtics can make him into a player that can, that can help out right now? I know he can guard. I know he can move. I know he can fly around. But can he fit into the team? Those are things that we'll figure out as the season kind of progresses. The way I look at this, Giles, is that over the course of three moves, they swapped out two players, right? Like Lamar Stevens and Delano Banton were not playing big roles for this team. I don't know if Xavier Tillman and Jaden Springer will play big roles moving forward. I do think Tillman especially will have an opportunity over the course, five back-to-backs remaining, 27 games in like 52 days to the finish line. You're going to need someone to help pace your big men to the finish line. They are both offensively limited, but I think they can help defensively, and they're going to win the trust of Joe Mazzulla that way. So we'll see. I, I think part of this is for this year and some depth that you maybe can lean on more than you thought with Banton and Stevens, and then you kind of roll it into the future where they're going to have the opportunity to potentially look at these guys for deeper into the future. And I do think it's just, it's just adding a little bit more depth. But as Cal said, we'll get into this later. I don't know if there's an obvious path to another big man or whatever with the buyout market, but still some steps to take here if the Celtics want to fill that last roster spot. So as far as Xavier Tillman and Jane Springer go, what, what do they kind of offer as far as roster flexibility kind of moving forward? Because the other thing to this as well is that they, they did give up players on their way out and they have, they have that one spot open, but, you know, everyone kind of brings up bird rights. And, and bird it's, rights, it's sometimes kind of, you're getting in the weeds a little <laughs> bit. But what are these two players in particular, with their contracts set up the way they are, what does that mean for the Celtics? And, and could this be more of a move that Brad Stevens is looking at as, you know, for the future and not just for the stretch run here? I think it's, it's a little bit of both, right? You're hopeful that they come in and they acclimate quickly and you can lean on them over the course of the last 31 games here. But if it's for the longer future, the Celtics don't have a lot of avenues to add talent. They are a second apron team. They're spending big money. Jalen Brown's contract kicks in next season. They're going to be committed. You need lower cost players that you hope emerge as rotation players. The, the way I explain this is, in a vacuum, Celtics can't go out and add anybody beyond a minimum contract this offseason. What you can do now is, with these guys in-house, you have bird rights for someone like Tillman. You could sign them to a fair number. You can examine Springer and see how long you, maybe you'd like to keep him around. And so there are avenues for this to, to, to stretch longer into the future. You've just added some flexibility, whereas I don't think Lamar Stevens and Delano Banton would have been back next year. I think, I think Springer is what you called I don't want to call it cheap. I don't like the word cheap. Inexpensive laborer, right? I think that those guys, I think him, Spring, Springer in general, like he's a first-round draft pick, so his salary does go up. But, like, I think they believe in him. I don't think they're making a move for a 21-year-old if they're just making the, run, uh, making the choice for a run for the NBA Finals. So I think that's a short-term, long-term. And I know you mentioned could they end up trading him in the future? Yeah, probably. Like, you always want good players. So right now he had a great preseason. He improved a ton since that first year when he was playing in the G League. If the Celtics feel like there's something, there's like a, like a lost talent there, well, if they make him a better player, then he becomes more valuable to other teams, a guy you can throw in in a trade. But he also is a guy that if you feel like you, you can get him moving forward, maybe you can develop him a little bit, and maybe you believe in the guy. So we'll see all that when the games start to happen. We'll see how Joe Mazzula uses him. I'll have an answer, not from the front office, but I'll be able to see what the front office is thinking 
by watching him play with this group. And just, I think it's $4 million next year. It's a, it's a number that helps in, in a lot of regards, like whether it's just low cost or whether it's, you know, tri potential trades. But I do think they like it. For, former first-round pick, we've heard Brad talk a lot about you need guys. Like, look at the way Miami Heat continuously develop guys. So this is a way to get them when you don't necessarily have the picks to go get them. And I, did, I think I saw somewhere, too, you know, with Philadelphia, Sam Cassell obviously being from there, mm. you know, it spoke highly of Jaden Springer. So there's a connection there. You can understand why. You know he does? He did? I, 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 saw, I saw it. No, I saw that tweeted out, I think it was by a Philadelphia person. Got it. Yeah. Okay. yeah From you know, last just, year and say this kid is legit. Yeah. Because he also said Tyrese Maxey's legit before anybody else Nailed said it. that he's legit. So, I mean, I know Springer's a freak, but he's a freak of nature. Flies so, around. if you have a live body, he's got good length, and he, and he likes to defend. He's not one of these guys that it's a great athlete and just wants to dunk. Like, he gets after it defensively. He guards the best player when he gets on the floor. So, I think there's a lot to like there, but you don't know until you see it out there. You can mm -hmm. see how he fits in with the way that we run offense. Recent okay. games, guarding Steph Curry, guarding Luka, like he's not afraid of a challenge. Okay, uh, the other question here is too, because I know that, you know, you guys have both mentioned Alex Caruso is a name that you've thrown out there for this trade deadline. Do you look at it and, and I, I know that you had hopes that, that maybe they would go out there and add some, some serious firepower to this roster that they have right now. Do you feel like they did enough? I, because the other thing, too, is that it's not like other teams went out there and made any major moves. I mean, I heard, like, this is the thing about the NBA that I didn't like, I don't like. It did, and, I don't, and, and this year's trade deadline wasn't as bad. It's like all these teams, like the good teams, are all like, we got to do more to get better. We got to do this. We got to do that. And all the teams that are an absolute train wreck slash dumpster <laughs> fire – or all like, well, I like what we got. I'm cool right now. <laughs> Steve Kerr just called his team. This is a special group right here. Special group? <laughs> special group? You had KD Steph, Clay Thompson, Draymond Green. You won 73 games, and this team's a special group? I'm done with the low-level teams saying, I'm cool. I like where we're at. I'm really – I like where we're at now. Below 500. Then we were at the beginning of the season. Zero and zero. Like, I don't, I don't get it. What, I just don't get it. What is the Bulls' plan? Yeah, I, I don't know. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. I don't know. I think, Tom, I think there's a lot of people, and I'm, no disrespect, I probably would do the same thing when I'm getting $6 million to guess wrong all the time, right? <laughs> I, I really think that they're like, if I don't make a move, like if I, let's just say, trade Alex Caruso to the Boston Celtics, mm -hmm. and the ownership is just chilling around like, all right, we got to get rid of Caruso, right? Like, oh, we got a first-round draft pick. And Caruso's holding the championship trophy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think the ownership is going to be like, you know what? Fire him. I don't want to see the player mm -hmm. that I signed that you couldn't make work in Boston winning a championship. So, well, the, obviously you're making and you're making the point here. It takes two to tango here. It takes right. two to make the trade. And, yeah, I think it's them. I think it's all the dumpster fires. They like the dumpster fires. Like they keep them warm at night. I don't know. <laughs> I think the, you brought it up. The, the best way to phrase it. No one else in the league made a move that I sat there and said, "Man, I wish the Celtics had gotten involved in that." So that tempers the idea that they should have done something bolder. There's no move out there that I was like, "Oh man, I really wish they had kind of explored that further." No one was was moving quality players, and so you did the best you could on the fringes. How did the Warriors not trade a guy? A four hundred yeah. million dollar. Payroll, 400 million. <laughs> they're gonna and find they, it. They they're out of the playing right now, and they got a special group. 400 million. Or, so let yeah. them get one. What are we doing? <laughs> what are we doing? And then we like should should the Celtics do more? No disrespect to your question. That's a good question. But should we have done more? No. How about those dumpster fire teams should have done more? They should have done more. And then somehow they like put it on us. Like, ooh, you really need our guy? No. You need to get rid of your guys. Like. You guys are have you guys have problems? No, we got a special group. Like, and no, no disrespect to any of those guys. I'm not trying to be mean Sometimes to those guys, but I don't know when this shift happens. Like, when did it happen? Like, the bad teams used to say, "Why don't we just play young guys and get some picks?" And now these bad teams are like, "Ooh, I like where we're at. I think we got a really well, good group." Does it have something to do with the play-in tournament, yeah. right? Because you have more teams that are eligible for the playoffs now, so you have less teams that are, you know, set on on being sellers. I don't know. Maybe, maybe that's the reason. And that there's there's there's, there's real truth to that, right? Like, yeah. You can claim like we're still in it. Okay. Mm. I mean, <laughs> you're, you're really in that. It. And then you're gonna play us and get smacked. You're gonna be like, dang it, we should have traded our guys. <laughs> uh, meanwhile, there were some moves made in the Eastern Conference. You saw the Bucks. Uh, they they acquired Patrick Beverly from Philadelphia. The Knicks got. Boyan Bogdanovich and Alec Burks from the Pistons. And the winners over here. They are. Uh, the Sixers, meanwhile. And they didn't even give up any picks. We're right. going to get into that later right now. We're doing it right now. You want to talk about the Knicks, go for it, man, because they, they're the biggest risers as well as far as the Eastern Conference odds go. So what do you like about what the Knicks did and how, how for real are they?
real deal because you know, here's the here's the reality, right? They got what you call like a lot of different guys that can have a, a, a night. Now it is up to Tibbs to figure out <laughs> what guy I'm going to use, right? Because but you got to ride the hot hand. We know Jalen Brunson's a guy who's delivered in the playoffs. On the contrary to what all the WNBA players think, this is the guy who's delivered in the playoffs, right? But but Julius Randle up and down. Some of the other guys like Josh Hart up and down. Like like the reason why they got uh, rid of Quentin Grimes up and down. So they're looking for more consistency. They don't know if OG Ananobi is going to deliver. They they have they don't know if he's going to be a guy that, that that makes that that next step. So if you get five guys that can score twenty on any given night and you push the right buttons. You could score enough. Tibbs believes in his defense, and I do too. Now that they made the trade for OG Ananobi, their defense has been the number one defense in the NBA. So they're just looking for more scoring outside of Jalen Brunson. And this could be the year that Julius Randle kind of breaks off, breaks out of his playoff slump. It, okay. This could be the year that other guys have stepped up, like OG Ananobi shoots over 45% for three. We don't know, but I know they have a lot of options. And for the Knicks, they didn't they didn't get rid of the opportunity. Yeah, that's the scary part. To to trade for a superstar, they probably improved their opportunity yeah. to trade for a superstar in the in the offseason. Good job by them, and I've been killing their front office not the last two years, but before that, they've fig- they they got they got the coach, they got the right guy in place. They did a good job this trade deadline. Are they the scariest in the East, neck behind Boston? Well, I'm not scared of Boston. We're Boston. What do no, you I'm saying no, no, you're saying that it, who's who's the scariest rival for Boston? Um, Miami didn't do anything, so I would say, I mean, Knicks are good, Cleveland's good, Indiana's good. Wow, no I, I can't co-sign, I can't co-sign Milwaukee. I know they got the wow. stars, but they don't guard. Wow. So, I don't know. I mean, all those well, teams are. I don't think Pat Beverly moves the needle all that much, but, hey, look, beggars can't be choosers, so I do think it's at least somebody that wants to play defense, and I don't know if they, that's not going to fix them, but it's, it's at least somebody that's going to try. I still can't get past, like, Giannis and Lillard, like, you can't write them off, but I'm with you. Like, you watch it, and you're thinking, man, defensively, they're just not going to hold up in the playoffs, and so I, I'm with you. I wonder if the Knicks are just crawling a little bit closer. I, I'm not ready to put them. So who do you have here. right now, Bucks? I'll go Bucks and then Knicks. I mean, this is interesting because even a month ago, you would have said Milwaukee and Philadelphia yeah. are in the top but three. Yeah, and now, now you might be saying that it's the Knicks and Cleveland. And, yeah. and Cleveland well, didn't do much yeah. today. It's, it's, they, it's February. Like, we got March and then April roll around. And, you know, like Joel Embiid will get healthy. And he'll, if he knocked out, you know, six games in a row of 30 points, we say that guy, right? So, it's, it's, it's the Eastern Conference is tough. By the way, no one ever talks about it. Two teams that no one talks about. It's amazing. You know, I do the national show. It's. Cleveland and the Clippers like like the Clippers are like sneaky the best team in the NBA right now over the last six weeks but no one talks about them and Kawhi Leonard should be an MVP but somehow like on these uh, uh, the, the odds he's like plus 10,000 but there's a good chance he wins the MVP this year so there's just a lot of good teams that people don't talk about Cleveland's another one the addition of Georges Yang and Max Strus. what I told you guys they were going to be good then I admitted I was wrong because they weren't good. They actually became <laughs> really good right now. They're like I think nine and one over their last. Or they lost. They've won. They haven't been healthy. Fourteen of yeah. fifteen, and they're getting guys back. So, yes. like they're they're a really good team. So, but when we when we get closer to it and all the buyout stuff settles, we'll figure out an answer. But that's for what it. I need. I need another month. I need to see like where does Milwaukee settle in with Doc? Where does like New York wash out here and they'll lose OG for a couple weeks here because of the cleanup he's having? And then we'll see. We'll then buyout market. We'll know better. Let's have this conversation in end of March about who's the the real rival and who's like to worry about. By the way, the Pacers made about 15 moves today too. We didn't have time, we didn't have time to get to all of them. All right, um, Scal was very worked up about all the dumpster fires in the in the league who did not make moves. He had, uh, I think we were we were joking over the weekend about Golden State and what they might do, and I was saying, you know, maybe they double down and just try to go get a big contract, add a add a star player. He was like, maybe they trade Clay Thompson, and uh, evidently they just decided to to rat it out. And so, um, yeah, it's going to be very interesting to see uh, how this all plays out. One team in the West that did get better is the Oklahoma City Thunder. And we dove into sort of the bigger picture of the Western Conference and the NBA title odds overall in the uh, in the second part of our trade deadline special. Let's get to that, too. Taking a look at the current NBA championship odds, you see the Celtics there alone atop at plus 280. These are on the Fanatic Sportsbook app. Um, The biggest changer, if you look at the movement, look at the Knicks. I know. 15 mm. to 1. They were 33, 34 to 1 a week ago. 
So they have moved the most. Uh, Cleveland's also moved quite a bit as well after they've won some games. They weren't pictured on there, but as you do take a look at, you know, what the, the rest of the league did today, you've already started to get into it, Scal, talking about the dumpster fires not really doing enough. Uh, but we didn't see many, many, Lakers, many stars move. Golden I mean, State, like, I mean, isn't it wild that none of these, it felt like the West was pretty quiet. Phoenix made a little move. Yeah. But, like, I, I don't know. I, I kept waiting. I, I was like, are their clocks set to 3 p.m. Eastern? Do they know this thing's over at 3 p.m.? And didn't feel like anyone in the West, no, really. No one wants to deal anymore. No one. It's like, I think they do those deals in the offseason where there's five first-round picks in this. Like, I think at this time, I, I don't think people want to move star players. And I think it's risky for them. And that's kind of the reason why I think they sat on their hands. So the other thing, too, is that our, our team's starting to look around and say, you know what, the Celtics might be so good that mm. are they actually considering where they stack up against Boston? We we're kicking this around uh, earlier in the newsroom, and I don't know, are you really going to mortgage some of your future if you feel like you're that far behind? I mean, how many teams are realistically in the hunt here to, uh, to contend? I, I, I just think NBA players are irrational. NBA teams are irrational. I think everybody, even the Lakers are looking at it and going, you know, we've sucked. We've been up and down half the year, but we're going to be there in the end. And that's just the way you think. I don't think you ever look across and go, oh, they're teams. But if they really think that way, shouldn't they have added today? I mean, I, I think they're just limited in the resources that they yeah. have to go out there and do it. Right? And so, Wait a minute. They still have their 2029 pick. I mean, you're talking about one. What does one pick get you nowadays? In 2029, that pick's going to be really yeah, good. Well, that's like, the thing. You know? Like, they're not. They're Like, how can they be good in 2029? I think they have to keep that to the summer and then because that's the going to be their last swing to keep this thing together and yeah, maybe yeah, they're just yeah. kind of like you know I, I think I think Chris is right like I just think it feels like they, they don't know if a trade's going to make them better you know to incorporate a star player halfway through I, I I wonder if they just think let's just stand pat and see what we, we what we can do the playing tournament helps right you're not guys aren't looking on the outside in they think well we'll just get into the plan even if it doesn't work then you can kind of you know spin the future if you do it now and it doesn't work out, then LeBron James, who has a player option, quite possibly could just pick up and leave. So I think for the Lakers, they think, well, if LeBron is going to leave, why don't we at the last minute go and trade for somebody and then we can convince him to stay and sign another one plus one or whatever it may be. So I think there's a little bit of that. The Warriors is the one I really don't understand. Why? They did not just like try to get rid of their guys. I just don't get that. Maybe they did, and there's again, it, t it does take two to. I heard there's a lot of people that wanted uh, Wiggins. I, you could have like, it doesn't matter. I don't know what was offered, so I don't. I mean, it's like I don't know if people. I heard Dallas was interested. I heard a lot of people were interested in Andrew Wiggins, but they didn't know. I'm just surprised that Steve Kerr, the day before the trade trade deadline, says our group is special, and Joe Lacob is like. No, our, our group is especially expensive, <laughs> and we're sitting outside the plane. So our, the only thing that's special about this group is the price tag. That's it. It's unique. It's never been done. We've never had a $400 million payroll. This is the first time, which makes them special because there's one of one, but it doesn't mean they're good. So I don't know. All right. Well, it, and meanwhile, again, just like you, you look across the league, and there wasn't like that one headline move that, that kind of really is going to define this no, trade deadline. No, but I, think I mean, Dallas did something, right? I like what Dallas did. You don't. I, so I'm, I'm torn on it. Like, I mean, they just kind of gave up for Grant. And uh, now we're going to get into it. So I don't want to spoil it too much. But I look at what Dallas did, and I say, kind of the same player coming back. I liked what they upgraded at the big man spot. But, like, I don't, I don't, I don't, uh. Yeah, so that was P.J. Washington for, for Grant Williams. P.J. Washington better than Grant Williams. No? For, for Dallas? P.J. Washington. So, Grant, at least you could lean on. In the playoffs, he went up against Kevin Durant, Giannis, and showed me. Yeah, that yeah, yeah. No, I like I like Grant Williams. You guys know I like Grant. Yeah. Williams, so but, I, I, so PJ, I don't know. Like, but they're sick of him already. So at least PJ Washington, <laughs> they're not sick of. Yeah, I know, but you shouldn't. No, no. This is like a thing. Like, like Grant Williams made every shot for the first month. Yeah. And he hasn't made one since. So, I mean, that's an exaggeration. Because that's not factually accurate. That's just you know, <laughs> me overreacting. Over we, we're with it. Yeah. But it's like. So they're like, all right, well, he, you, like, hopefully you'll get a little boost when you go to Charlotte, and maybe P.J. Washington will make some shots. Dallas is simple. We need guys to make shots. I think P.J. Washington's a good player. He's a really good player. Yeah, I'm not disagreeing. I just don't know if the difference between Grant Williams and what we've seen and P.J. Washington is. Gotcha. PJ. We'll find out. Yeah. Grant had, like, you looking at the Grant Williams that didn't miss or the Grant Williams that didn't mm -hmm. make? We'll see. All right. How about the buyout market? Because that's going to be the conversation that everyone has at this point. No, 2008, was that Sam Cassell for you guys? 
That 2008 roster? So P.J. Brown. P.J. Brown, P. J. Brown. Well, both, actually. So it was February they did P.J. Brown, uh, but who was just sitting at home? He wasn't a buyout. And then Sam was a buyout. Yeah. And March 3rd, he came Okay, so who, who could be potentially a guy who's added to this roster? They've I got the spot available. Big, I think we need a big, like, like just a, a versatile big, not another big man that plays underneath. I like Kata and Luke Cornett, but let's say we wanted to go with another Tillman type of player, right? I just, we're so deep at the wing position, and I'm fine with a Brissett, and I'm fine with Hauser and Pritchard. I, I just think we got enough wings. I think if, if twofold, if, I don't know about a guy we'll, in the bio market we can get that can help us in the playoffs. Maybe we can, but definitely just like the stretch between now and the end of the season. Like you want to keep guys Pushing hard. See, when the end of the season comes, Al Horford will have a game where he plays like 38 minutes mm -hmm. to build his body up for the playoffs, but he'll also have games where he sits out. Like, right. that's how you do it. Like, that's, that's the way guys per start preparing. Like, guys' minutes will go up, but they'll also take games off. So, it's, to me, it's about having a bio guy that could sort of uh, at the stopgap between now and the end of the season. And while we're waiting to see who – comes on the market, you'll get a chance. Hopefully Tillman's healthy enough. I know he was bad on some. They sat out that game when Memphis was here. Like, maybe get him out there, see how comfortable you feel with him being the third, fourth pick, however you want to phrase it. You still got Luke Cornett. You still got Nemesh Kata, who could go up to the parent roster. I start looking at guys that got traded today. Like, what does Utah do with Otto Porter Jr.? Like, some of the Celtics were rumored to be interested in. Do they buy him out? Does that – do you swoop in and get someone who at least has some playoff experience? That's the guy. And, and – so explain. Go, don't go to me. Go to him. Go explain the um, the whole uh, twelve million. 12. Yeah. So 5. this is go important. The People, pay attention. Cause this <laughs> stuff is going to make your head hurt. Go the, ahead. The Celtics are an apron team. One of I think six or seven in the league. Uh, teams like the Clippers, big spenders. You cannot sign anybody that was previously making twelve point four million dollars or more. It cancels out a lot of the guys that are going to come onto the market. So you just look at the start looking the guys that below the lawn right. Otto Porter Jr. Like, I'm just wondering who it's going to be. We don't know yet, and we'll see. But of the guys that are, are ticketed to be waived right now, slim pickings. Okay. Uh, in the meantime, we, we already talked about Grant Williams, but here, here's some of the other Let's talk about OKC, baby. Well, that is interesting, right, Gordon? They still didn't get a big, though. I know, but. I like, don't understand what they're doing. So those are the big two. Is Gordon Hayward getting dealt to uh, the Thunder and Grant Williams to the Hornets? We talked about Grant, and there, there you go on Gordon Hayward. Kelly Olenek yeah. to Toronto. What a week he's from Western Canada, but he's still, you know, somewhat of a homecoming his, his there. His dad was like a, a big deal in Toronto. Marcus Morris, could he be on the buyout market? I mean, he could be, but uh, there's not enough shots in Boston for him. Okay, well, he's, he's in San Antonio <laughs> now. And of course, you got Dennis Schroeder and uh, Evan Fournier who are... We're also on we're not, the We're not today. calling Evan Fournier a former Celtic. That was a cup of tea and two, two bouts of COVID. But I do love the Gordon Hayward move. So, uh, like, I, th I, I told you the other day, I thought someone would take a chance on him because he could, I, he could have waited to the buyout market. But I love that Oklahoma City was aggressive. I think they know they are in a position where, like, maybe one more player, a veteran presence. I know he doesn't fit what they need in terms of a big man. But you know he's going to have a bring in that huge basketball IQ and make the right play and move the ball. And I wonder if he'll just be revitalized going to that that situation. I am eager to see if he can be like sort of just giving that a little more of a nudge and maybe they get they find a big on the buyout. Yeah, I, I think a nudge. I, I think that's, that's exactly what you'll see from Gordon Hayward. I think he'll be revived a little bit out of the dumpster fire that is Charlotte, right? <laughs> so um, I do like that move. Uh, I actually like Grant Williams going back to Charlotte. I think it'll be good for his player development like, mm. like he played off of Brown and Tatum here he played off of Luka and Kyrie there let's see maybe Grant Williams could take a, a, a nice step towards a little bit bigger of a role I know a lot of teams out there really like his toughness his defense his, his mouthpiece which I like it too I, I like people that talk a lot so you know he could be a guy that could, uh, that could definitely I don't know if you're going to change Charlotte but it could, you could help a little bit we should have had a Boston Oklahoma City finals in 2012 Let's make it a reality now. Oh, yeah, there you That's go. That's what I'm going They need a big. But anyway. They get some veteran experience at least here, though. You know, Gordon. No, I'm, I'm a big fan of what they're doing. They, they just need a big. I don't, that's not, they don't, they're just not big enough. But the biggest winner on trade deadline day? Knicks. The New York Knicks. Yeah, all day. All right, it's a fun show. Uh, I, I, some years we have an hour, and that's the years the Celtics don't make a trade, and we're, uh, we're, we're scrambling to, to fill it up. Um, one thing I did want to kind of end on here is we there's some chatter there about the buyout market and you know of the names that are initially going to be waived and it's a it's a little bit of slim pickings so I don't know if there's anyone that you look at the Celtics roster and you say this person would be better than whether it's what you've added in Xavier Tillman and Jaden Springer or just what you have in-house Gal is pretty adamant that he'd like 
one more big guy, you know, just sort of a, another little bit of insurance in case, let's say, Porzingis had to miss a stretch of games or Al had to miss a stretch of games, especially if you get into the postseason. You know, just having that luxury of, of regardless of how Tillman and Fournette and Kada and all that. So it, it will be fascinating to see if there's anybody that comes available that that makes sense for them. Um, if ultimately they don't fill that 15 spot, they can sign Kada to the roster, uh, elevate him from a two-way contract that will allow them to carry him into the postseason. Um, and maybe that's all the move you got to make. But I do think they'll they'll kind of just take a look. That's why they left a roster spot open in all this maneuvering. Um, the name that I kind of default to is Otto Potter, Otto Porter Jr. Easy for me to say. Uh, does have that championship experience and has that size, can play both forward positions. Uh, I'll throw in a, a plug here for he's a St. Louis guy. So uh, Jason Tatum would probably be perfectly fine with that. Uh, I just think that's the type of player you're looking at. I mean, you can go through the list, Seti Osman. Um, it's just DeLon Wright, if he got moved, uh, got, if, if the, the, the Wizards decided to, to waive him. Some guys that the Celtics were interested in probably going into the deadline. And, um, you know, we'll see if they end up getting set free at this point. But, you know, it, like, I think it, the one of the things is that with the, the moves or the lack of moves is sort of a vote of confidence for your top eight on this roster. And, and so I, I told you guys, like, I think it was fair to be, Will, you know, you felt really good about top six. You know, the starters are going to be great. You know, Al Horford's going to bring it especially in the postseason, the question marks, of course, are Peyton Pritchard and Sam Hauser. And that's not to take away from what they've done this year. Peyton's still one of the best net rating guys in the league. Sam has shot the ball, like, especially well, especially in calendar year 2024. So, like, I'm confident they can be impactful in the playoffs. It's just you got to hold up defensively. You're playing less minutes. So, you know, you got to maximize when you are out there. And so, you know, part of the reason we saw we talked so much about dreaming big and the Caruso's of the world and, and possibly trying to just get something a little bit more defined at that position is just, you know, you, you feel a little bit better about that seven, eight spot. And, but I think what Brad Stevens is saying is like, look, Peyton gave him the contract. He's responded, didn't hit a lot of shots at the start of the year, but man, he's been great impacting winning overall. And that's super important. And Sam has, hasn't had as many dips as he did maybe a year ago. And so even O'Shea, once, you know, Brad came out and said, we need another big wing and, and throughout that challenge uh, has, has responded well and played well in, in the minutes that he's gotten. So Joe has some options and most importantly, the Celtics have a, a five game cushion in the Eastern conference. Uh, I need another month to sort of sort out who the, the, the main concern should be. I'm still worried about Milwaukee because of that, because of that tandem of talent in Giannis and Lillard, but Pat Beverly isn't going to be enough to, to tip that defense back to where it needs to be. So still some stuff for Doc Rivers to shore up up there. And I need to see the Knicks. You know, I don't know if uh, if adding two depth pieces moves the needle all that much. I think it still comes down to how good Jalen Brunson and Julius Randle play and OG getting healthy after this little procedure. And so we'll see. We'll see exactly how the East plays out. We get a nice little appetizer on on Sunday, a Super Bowl appetizer because they uh, Celtics will host the Heat. And, uh, you know, who, who didn't, who were surprisingly quiet today as well, which is always weird. So we'll, we'll get a chance to see where, where they're at. And, uh, you know, they, I, I keep saying they're cockroaches. They're always going to be around. And I feel like they could be players in the buyout market and kind of in, inject themselves into something, but so couldn't the Knicks and so couldn't the Sixers and Sixers added buddy healed, but nothing that makes me, uh, makes me sit here and say, man, Celtics are, I got to worry a little bit more. I think the Celtics play to their potential. They're still the best team in basketball. Um, you know, Denver's right there with them, but, um, beyond, beyond my intrigue with the West and OKC and does Gordon Hayward give them that, that little jolt to move a little closer? Do they add a big man over the course of the buyout market? It's going to be a fun little run to the finish line of the season, but it starts Friday night. We're back at you against the Washington Wizards. Brad Stevens is going to talk to the media on Friday morning. I get a chance to sit down with Brad. So we'll have that as part of the post game pod tomorrow. As we uh you know digest the deadline and what's to come so i need everybody to go like subscribe thanks for checking us out on the youtube page we'll catch you next time on the celtics talk podcast